Hello, everyone, and welcome to this podcast, or sorry, podcast, this webinar on preventing bottlenecks during uh, mobile development. So today we're going to be talking about basically the, the cringiest thing that I think developers have, which are bottlenecks or basically slowing progress as you're trying to get something deployed. We're going to be specifically looking at mobile, and I'm joined today uh, by some experts. So I'm, I'm, pretty, uh, I'm pretty excited to hear what they have to say about it. Um, and as we dive in a little bit deeper on, you know, things that, you know, cause bottlenecks, how we work around them. Uh, but before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over and let Jason and Lauren introduce themselves. And then we'll go ahead and get started with some questions. If, you know, during this webinar, you have any questions at all, be sure to drop those inside the Q&A. Um, we'll take them, you know, as they come. Um, I know that Jason is really excited uh, to talk about any feature requests. That's something that we were uh, talking about beforehand. But uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Jason, first. Uh, give us a little introduction to yourself. Thanks, Rob. Um, and thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm Jason. I'm a director of engineering at Strava. Um, I wear two hats. One of, that, one of those hats is um, the director of engineering of growth, the growth organization. Um, and the other is the engineering lead um, here in Dublin as we build out our kind of European headquarters in Dublin, Ireland. Um, I've been at Strava for over seven years, um, where I joined as an iOS engineer. Um, so I, I said to Rob, my claim to fame is I'm still, I think, third on the old time uh, contribu contribution list uh, of iOS engineers. But I think that's going to be taken over soon. Um, but that's a little bit about me. Um, I'll pass it over to you, Lauren. Hey, guys. So uh, I'm Laurent. So I'm the co-founder and the CTO at Waldo. Uh, and uh, so over the last uh, 10 years, basically of my careers, I've always been uh, doing mostly backend stuff, um, but very often to serve uh, mobile first uh, stuff. And so as part of Waldo, it's kind of the other side, and now we're helping mobile teams. Uh, so we don't have a very strong uh, mobile app ourselves, except for testing. Uh, but uh, we see a lot of mobile uh, folks, uh, which makes that interesting as well. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, it seems like we've got some pretty good kind of coverage here. Uh, myself, I am a mobile architect at DraftKings. So, you know, I'll chime in as much as I can with these experts. And we've actually got Turin with us as well from Park Mobile. So that was like excellent timing. You came in like right as we're going to do... Uh, uh, the next introduction. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. I think you're muted. Uh, it might automatically do that when you come in. There we go. That's a, that's a classic. You're muted, right? <laughs> um, well, I apologize for coming in a couple of minutes late. My name is Tarun Kurma. I'm a senior manager uh, at Park Mobile. Uh, my, in my previous life, I was a, a test architect uh, prior to that. I did some uh, automation testing, development, um, and um, ETL development as well. So uh, I'm excited to be part of this panel, uh, and we can get into the questions right away. Yeah, and no apology needed. You needed that, uh, you know, kind of fashionable entrance. I think, you know, coming in here, so it makes sense. And and this is actually really exciting because I think we we cover a, a pretty large surface area when it comes to just development in general and as we look towards you know mobile development and bottlenecks and of course when we think of things like bottlenecks uh, i think you know that that's pretty it's pretty broad topic right there's environmental things or what you'd say like external factors um, between you know device fragmentation os fragmentation there's technical aspects of how you set up you know automated pipelines with testing and monitoring um, so even being able to get into the process aspect of you know working with product working with QA you know what's your commit push you know merge process like what's your you know your your source control workflow um, and so kind of looking at that you know from a, a holistic level uh, it's pretty broad so I think what we what I first want to do kind of curveballing it here is is kind of go around the group and I'll start with Lauren in like when you when you think of bottleneck um, you know what is like what comes to mind first um, whenever you think of, you know, whenever you're looking at the development process, and, and by that I mean, you know, everything from conception or ideation to actual development to deployment, you're actually getting that out there. What do you think of first whenever you think of bottleneck? 
Yeah, so I think one of the first thing that would come to mind is whatever happens bef between the moment where something is supposedly done to the moment it's actually out there. And, and that time is very, very long sometimes. And so uh, I see that's the one where we've spent the most time trying to reduce that and doing all the things that start from, you know, I'm a developer and I think things are ready. Uh, and uh, I'd love someone to uh, look at my code to uh, I'm a developer and I'm probably showing my mom what I just did and <laughs> contributed to that's currently live and that everybody can see. And so um, especially for that one, I think what we uh, in our team mostly spend time on is um, really um, anything that could be automated in that time. So. Uh, how can we make sure that if you're trying to test something, you immediately can as a manual tester. Uh, you also don't have to test everything because there are things that are already covered. And how can you automatically, uh, once things are merged or decided to be good, how can you automatically get everything to be to run? Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, and I think that that's going to lead well into the next question. But before I get into that, I figure I throw it over to Jason what do you think of whenever you think of bottlenecks or you know you can tell us a memory of like the worst bottleneck you faced or something like that like what do you think of yeah i think um you know the director of engineering side of me is thinking about the what and the why are we building right um like are we on the same page but you know let's just assume you've gotten past that um you know the how there's so there's so many complexities with the how, right? And as your company and your product scale in terms of your user base and the number of engineers you have, that can become increasingly complicated. Um, I remember when I was an iOS engineer seven years ago at Strava, the, the hacky things I would do and deploy just to test a, an idea were, um, you know, there's a lot I could do. Um, and I would be horrified if someone did that now, right? They would probably bring down the website. Um, just like, you know, the, we have 7 billion activities on Strava and we were doing count queries on those that activity database back in the day. And nowadays, you know, that would immediately, immediately crash uh, everything uh, if we did that nowadays. But uh, and so there's a little bit of like, what is the structure and the framework you're providing to your engineering team so that they know how to, you know, create solutions for the for the product and visions you have? Um, with safety nets, with not being able to bring down your whole website by mistake, with not having to be an expert at your entire ecosystem. Um, one of the teams in my org is the, the feed team. And that's so interesting because everything at Strava shows up in the feed somehow. And so one of the biggest bottlenecks we have is coordinating a lot of different teams working in the same surface area. You know, and mobile apps are small, right? You can see maybe one and a half feed entries on Strava and there's you know, a lot of teams trying to do a lot of different things in the same code paths with the same logic. And I think that's really interesting from just how do we work together? How do we combine code? But also how do we test? And they're like, there's so many different permutations on what can show up in someone's feed. Are, you know, are they paid? Are they free? Do they have activities? Are they you know, a new user, an existing user? All those permutation, there's always a permutation that someone misses and doesn't realize and that inevitably causes problems. Um, so it's like observability, it's coordination, it's all of that. Um, it's a really interesting problem and it's a human problem at the end of the day, And right? You, you know, hopefully you can solve a lot of that through automation, but also um, human process and human coordination and, and alignment have to come with that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think this like the human problem aspect is something that we'll probably dive into a little bit more because I think you hit the nail on the head is that all these things really kind of funnel down into that in eventually, inevitably, whenever you're talking about bottlenecks, just because, you know, you're, you're, you're slowing up a human of some sort from being able to do something and there's you know multiple aspects of it. So Turin, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think of whenever you think of bottlenecks? The, the, the theme of today when I'm talking about uh, testing is going to be feedback, right? I'm thinking about the one of the main functions of what we do is providing feedback. And now how much of a delay will uh, can we accept as part of this feedback loop um, is how I view a bottleneck, right? If we are getting closer to the first line of code then that's better feedback versus delivering a very mature application um, and then evaluating if it's the right uh, application that the market wants or the user wants 
So um, I'd like to share an interesting story about uh, about a bottle. Well, it turned into a bottleneck, but um, when we didn't think it was actually, we were building out a decision, uh, decision support system. Um, and we thought that we, uh, we had the right data, uh, we had the right analytics, we had the right tooling. Um, and we went about, uh, this was a few years ago when integrations were still, you know, uh, not as popular or as or as common as they are today. And we built it out. And the moment uh, we gave it to the uh, to the consumers, I said, we already have this. We have, we don't need this entire application uh, to support any of our decisions because we already have this. So we provided uh, we put in an engineering solution for a problem that didn't really exist, right? So instead, if we had brought them in and got the feedback earlier, asking them questions and and then providing them smaller cross sections of what the decision support system would be, then that would have been uh, a better approach. And the bottleneck throughout this whole thing was not having that communication, not having the feedback coming through the end users. Yeah, and that's it's kind of funny. I I smiled whenever you when you said that. Is that um, you know basically I, I'm sure we're all but we'll say we're all none of us are guilty of of basically creating solutions to problems that don't exist. Uh, seems to be a pretty common thing I think in the, the software world, especially as you mentioned, Jason, even being able to try some stuff out, you know, earlier on, and then ramifications of that kind of now, you know, if you were to try those things. Uh, but that actually that provides a pretty good segue to run into, uh, you know, what I guess how you measure uh, an effective solution that basically will eliminate different bottlenecks, right? And we've all kind of mentioned a variety of those, but I'm curious. I'll start with you, Lauren. Is it, how do you how do you know something is effective um, from a process standpoint in order to kind of minimize or mitigate those those bottlenecks? Yeah. So the way we measure things, I, I think the first uh, thing we're gonna measure is uh, how many things we're able to release in a quarter. And the way we do that is through uh, we use headway, which is how we communicate any new feature we get. And so it, it's, it allows to do two things. The first thing is basically that's actually a good way to see without looking at, you know, in details at every specific task that has been done, which is usually way too granular, what are the things that really got shipped? And the other thing is we have a very strong communication loop with our customers. So we use Slack for that. And because like we are SaaS, so it's not like B2C, we can communicate with each of them uh, very regularly. And so this is a headway and we also can get directly from there also their um, feedback. So it's basically two things. So it's a good measure of what has been done. It's also a very good way to get their feedback quickly. Uh, so that's something we've used a lot. Yeah. And, and yeah. then I would say for the rest, like we use a lot of observability. So um, I, I think a lot of the things we do are based also on infrastructure, getting things to be reliable, getting things to be always on. And so for all these things, we've invested very early on on how, how much, as much as we could. Uh, and so we we try to pipe as many key metrics to pager duty uh, through Datadog and we get as, as soon as something is out of normal, uh, we get that surface to all the engineers. Uh, so I would say it's a two, so we have the qualitative and really on the larger scope, this is what we got shipped and this is how it got uh, welcomed by customers. And then we have a lot of all the automatic, like are we are we up and running properly? Which is really, again, like super, super important for us. And that, that part is um, only automation and we just get the direct page back in one place, which is also something I think is super important in one, in one place in Slack that everybody can also have a look at it. Uh, so we know exactly what is currently going on. Yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense. I think if, if I were kind of sum that up and, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like it's basically simplifying transparency. So basically both simplifying and increasing transparency. So both on the quantitative and the qualitative side, making it as easily to access that kind of transparent feedback 
um, and then be able to quickly act on that in order to kind of eliminate, you know, something that might have been a bottleneck. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that we'll probably, that'll be a key, a key point, I think we'll all kind of circle around, uh, because I think that whether you're doing something from a back end process or front end, you know, that, that, that is pretty ubiquitous acro across the line, I think, um, whenever you think about being able to, you know, mitigate uh, bottlenecks. Uh, Jason, what are, your, what are your thoughts on, you know, being able to create an effective process in order to just, you know, minimize those bottlenecks as much as possible? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's probably something no company has figured out, right, <laughs> which is why we're talking about it. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting topic because, you know, you're always trying to get better. Um, you know, Lauren said, you, you mentioned uh, observability, um, and that's, you know, it's so key. Um, obviously, from an engineering perspective, it's uptime of our services. It's, you know, our latency, it's, you know, crashes, it's, have, you know, it's having, um, you know, pager duty, powering all of our incidents, um, reporting. And, um, you know, so it's just getting really great at that uh, operational efficiency is what we call it at Strava um, in terms of the engineering side. But then there's the um, the business side and obviously Strava is a freemium premium, premium product so you know all the engineering could be working um, but if we you know have bomb mistake turned off a subscription upsell um, you know that's just as bad as a crash somewhere right and that is not as easy you can't you know you can't pipe your revenue dollars into pager duty um, and so you know we have a lot of dashboarding in Tableau and we have some level of um, notifications through Tableau um, in terms of like hey you know this has gone down, but it, it's really difficult because um, for us, like a Monday is very different to a Sunday in terms of the you know the activity on our platform, the amount of dollars we're bringing in, and so often you'll have you know your your chief financial officer being like, hey, why is revenue you know dipped down today? And it's like, well, maybe it's just you know random, maybe or maybe someone you know messed up, and you know then you have to look back you know seven days to see what commits went into your last release, and um, it's really difficult to to kind of combine those business metrics and indicators and then backtrack to the engineering side. Um, and so that's something we're still trying to figure out is how do we, you know, how do we combine the observability from engineering, which, you know, I think there are many organizations that do this well. And I think there's you know, typically a pattern, a blueprint of, of how to get better there. How do we take that and bring it onto our business observability and product performance, right? Everything from revenue dollars, but ideally you have that for, you know, individual features and you know, you know, hey, this thing is, is not working. And one of the great, you know, um, you mentioned earlier qualitative, uh, I think, Taryn, you mentioned the qualitative side, like, you know, listening to your users, um, especially at a company like Strava is huge. Um, you know, we have a great community management team that has a great pulse. They're watching Twitter. Um, a lot of us watch Reddit. And so just looking at those symbols of, you know, when someone's upset enough to mention, hey, this is weird. Why is this, you know, why is this screen blank, right? Um, I, I think that's a great signal to go look at it. And I think it comes also down to your company culture in terms of initiative and ownership um, that you instill in engineers. Like if you see something that might be off, like go and explore that, go be a finder of problems. Don't just be a solver of problems, be a finder, be inquisitive. And I think if you can create a culture where, where folks feel that empowerment to have, to pursue a high degree of quality in everything they do, then, you know, you'll have a lot more people pursuing, you know, having that spotty sense of nah, something's not quite right here. Let me investigate. Oh, it's nothing. Or, oh my gosh, this could be potentially bad. So I think that piece of culture can help fill the gaps when automated processes um, can't quite, can't quite do everything you're, you're hoping to do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, as, as Lauren started kind of with, you know, dashboarding and certainly at DraftKings just to, sorry, kind of I like to interject here as much as I guess I can too, because I, you know, as you guys talk, it, it, we see a lot of similarities where we've got automated processes where, uh, you know, you even mentioned it kind of with Tableau and dashboards and, you know, there's some metrics that we can look at uh, that basically will hit thresholds of some sort, right? And then, you know, through pager duty or through some automated process will let us know, you know, if there's a warning of some sort, right? Because peak times are are different. We're even, you know, as we talk about it, you know, for DraftKings, peak times are, especially right now, like during NFL games, like right before and then during NFL games. And so you, you get a lot of, you know, reliance on those automated process to kind of tell you, because you can't really see everything at once. But then, you know, as you mentioned, Jason, you know, the other part about it is really taking pride um, and what you're creating and getting in there. And, you know, if you if you see something that's off, then get in and, you know, identify it first and then, you know, kind of work towards 
um, being able to, you know, resolve that. I think that's, uh, you know, that second part of it, which is really that attention to detail um, and getting there. But I'm, I'm curious, Turin, what, what are your thoughts on that? So um, we operate um, from a quarter to quarter, and that gives us the flexibility to um, to experiment within a few sprints and, you know, measure uh, from that experiment. And we call, uh, our approach is called OKR, Objectives and Key Results. Um, and the squads are encouraged to, or actually they have the autonomy to pick up whatever objectives they want to solve and the key results they want to measure. Um, so when we start off, we start off with 50% confidence on all the key results, right? And we measured this throughout uh, the quarter on a weekly basis, and then we'll see if they're trending towards, uh, you know, 100% uh, or, or trending towards 0%. So uh, this, this philosophy of having objectives and having those key results that the team is coming together and putting together what those would be, um, you know, they become the drivers of uh, of the problems and the solutions that they provide, right? Like Jason talked about uh, having the spidey senses, uh, trying to figure out where the problem lies and being a finder. Um, so if I give an if I can give an example, so if we want to do improvements on the payment side, right? We could um, do fraud prevention. We could invest in fraud, uh, fraud prevention, or we could say, hey, we're supporting universities, uh, parking now. The universities have a unique challenge because you have international uh, parkers that use uh, uh, international banks and credit cards. So we have to support uh, different types of payment processing across multiple countries. Um, so we can focus on which one we want to. The, the squads are uh, can pick up what they want to and provide solutions for it and start out with saying that I'm going to have 50% confidence on day one of the quarter and we'll measure how it goes. And they can build on that and on the subsequent quarters. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, it, it, you know, I, 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 uh, I, the theme that I'm hearing here really is just, you know, feedback, right? It, it just transparency in general. And I think we kind of nailed on this a little bit earlier and, and being able to, whatever, our, whoever our end users are, right? Making sure that they're satisfied um, in order to be able to kind of identify, you know, areas that need, that need some help. Uh, you need some TLC essentially to make that process smoother. Uh, but I also want to kind of jump into a question that we just got, and this is a little bit of a sidestep, but it's something that we've mentioned, um, you know, throughout this conversation so far about automation. But one of the questions we got are, what are the best practices to follow from a CI CD or, you know, continuous integration, continuous deployment perspective for mobile app development and how, uh, you know, automation tools like a Waldo or other tools out there uh, might be able to help with that. Um, so I'll, I'll first start with Jason. I'll kind of mix up the order here. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, like from a CI CD perspective. <laughs> I was hoping you would ask one of these other experts. Uh, expert is a strong word for me here. I'll give it a, I'll give it a best shot. I'll, I'll soften it up so Tarun comes in with the, with the excellent answer. Um, I think there's two things that come to mind, um, right? Like you want to make it easy to, to push code like you want to make it easy like the goal of engineers engineers is to is to write code that supports a product um you know business ambition it's it's not to figure out how to get your code from your machine to the cloud um and so we've done a lot at strava to make it very easy and actually we um we use slack as an interface for all of that which is great so you can kind of merge your merge your prs um we'll submit your your, your, your prs to be merged after you know tests pass um, you know, we do our whole, we call train conducting, which is the process of, of pushing out our mobile apps every week. That is all handled majority through, through Slack. Um, and so, you know, it's just made it easy. Um, and then the signals come back by Slack. And as you know, Lawrence, you said, you know, that single Slack channel where there's not just one pair of eyes, there's a lot of eyes. So I think that's one area. We've also tried to kind of mitigate the, the amount of kind of copy paste errors that can happen in terms of like deploying the wrong branch. Um, that that have kind of has has hurt us in the past, and so those kind of those are two areas I think just very high level that we've tried of like re reduce the the mistake potential of clicking the wrong button, doing the wrong thing, and then also just but also make it really easy to deploy code and have tests run. And I think the time I guess if there's a third pillar like the timeliness, like no one wants to wait forever. Um, and so that was actually one of the tough parts we've had with UI testing and why. We don't have many XC on iOS XC UI tests anymore because they took forever to run. 
and they broke every week because we kept changing our UI. And so everyone got pissed and, you know, we got rid of them. So we have some basic ones, but like, you know, there's one of those things where it's like, we can have comprehensive UI tests and then it takes two hours to merge your code on a, on a Tuesday night because we cut our, our beta branches Wednesday morning. So everyone's trying to merge code. And so that was one of the tough parts of like the timeliness needs to have, need, you know, matters because you also don't be don't want sitting and then find out if after four hours that you have a merge conflict because, you know, Joey over there submitted, you know, five branches in your, in your world. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's like, I feel like everybody can resonate uh, or, you know, re what you're saying kind of resonates with everybody out there because it's a pretty similar process. And actually, as I was looking at Tarun, I could tell that you were just chomping in the bit uh, to be able to jump in here. So what are your thoughts on that? So uh, I do not like giving out silver bullet kind of answers, but um, from my experience, um, we all start with good intentions of having CI/CD, but then it becomes a maintenance nightmare. There's always a, a disconnect between what uh, product wants, what dev is doing, what test is doing, and what the SRE or the ops um, are supporting. And one thing that I've seen that helps most of the time is having a mono repo, having source code and tests in the same repo. So when you're cutting out the a release branch or when you're cutting out a feature branch, right? You're stabilizing thing in a smaller unit and you're changing what your definition of done is or what, what your code complete is. Your code complete has been not just your coding, your coding part is done, but unit testing is done, integration testing is done, and your feature testing is also done, right? So it now no longer becomes, it's a dev issue, it's a test issue, but it's a, uh, team issue, right? It's a task that needs to be solved across the entire team. So that's really helped with uh, sustaining CICDs rather than just starting it and, you know, wishing that it'll continue. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And I'm anxious to dive into this even more. Lauren, what are your thoughts on, you know, uh, best practices for CICD? I think there are two. Uh, so for me, uh, I totally agree with Jason. So I, I would say, uh, just to put a, a number on it, uh, your CI CD should not take more than 20 minutes. So you want your feedback loop to be 20 minutes for anything that's like preventing a merge. And you actually want it to be preventive. That's the two things. Because the, the Worst thing that you can have is a CI CD that brings you results that are optional to um, mitigate or to fix. And so if you want to play the role of CI CD, you should put maybe little at the beginning, but only things that you're going to actually uh, play with and respect. And always, this is basically whatever is in your CI CD and that's giving you a, a, a red must be fixed as part of your code, as part of your change, or you should put it somewhere else. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we've seen the most. And here I can speak a little bit about um, Waldo uh, a little bit more. Uh, one of the things that we've seen the most is that uh, if you basically just give a status, but that you can look at it or not, uh, people will just say, oh yeah, okay, there's a problem. But I think it was also the problem a week ago. Maybe it's not my problem. Um, and so you want to always ensure that whoever introduces a problem uh, will have to fix it. And so you want to ensure that any problem has an owner and the owner should be actually tied logically to whoever caused it. And so that's one of the things that we've done. And so I, I can just talk a little bit about how automation tools uh, can help with that. I think it's to tie everything together. So uh, at Waldo, we spend a lot of time, for instance, working on a branch feature so that um, your merge can be blocked uh, by Waldo. So the goal is that you are really um, not able to do anything until everything you have on Waldo passes to green. And so it's really a feedback loop that's continuous. Whereas at the beginning, we had something that was whenever you build on the CI, we trigger Waldo, Waldo gives you a status. But then that status is up to you to do something with it. And that was causing a lot of problems we would, because it would cause people to just see it as a signal, not as an imperative to this is what I need to fix now. And, and so, yeah, I would say like really summary is whatever 
goes in there should go in less than 20 minutes and whatever happens in there and whatever signals you get from there must be acted upon before doing any next step. Yeah, I, and I that actually like sets this up, like tees it up really well where, you know, what you're talking about as far as, you know, that kind of setting your line in the sand of how long it should take. And then, you know, once that, you know, that process is done, that it should be actionable. And so I'm going to throw it over to Jason. And I'm curious, you know, as an engineering manager, and this is something even as we were kind of prepping for this beforehand that we talked about briefly, uh, but, you know, the, the organization of a team, right? Whenever you consider, you know, as we're kind of segueing from, you know, CICD and kind of keeping that in focus, right, where you're looking at an automated process, you know, when you look at everything from continuous integration to continuous delivery deployment, uh, there's a lot of people that could be involved in that. And so what do you think is the ideal way? And granted, this could probably change just based on the product and cadence and delivery and stuff like that. But how should you know, teams be set up for success whenever you're, you know, working with CI, CD, um, you know, and kind of going off of what Ren was talking about where, you know, once you hit that point, it's actionable, whether that's on the integration side or it's on the delivery side. How, how do you think that a team should be set up to, you know, kind of back to the original point of like, you know, mitigating or eliminating the bottlenecks as much as you can? What do you think is the best formula? Oh, that's a tough question. Um... I think this one, you know, super depends on your on your company size as well, and what kind of you know um, just like kind of organizational ability you have to solve some of these problems. I think you know, I, I, when we were much smaller at Strava, um, you know, we were still mostly oriented in product teams, you know, cross-functional product teams, um, and but there was an expectation that engineers worked towards the platform kind of health. That included CI, you know, CI, CD, um, et cetera. And so, you know, that was about 20% of your time was to um, work on your platform. So that could be, you know, many different things. Um, as we kind of have grown, um, you know, we have a team that that is responsible for the developer experience on all of our client platforms, it's called the client platforms team, or um, something like that. And that has allowed um, a team to be able to, you know, treat other engineers as their customers. Um, within the company. So, the, you know, the majority of engineers are on product teams at Strava. So, um, you know, product managers, designers, analysts, et cetera. Um, and then we have engineering teams kind of supporting the client, um, you yeah, know, the client health. Um, but like when you make that switch, it has been difficult. We, you know, we went through stages where we would, we would have a team working on that and then we would kind of run out of the high ROI developer um, productivity tasks to work on because we were just not big enough. And then that team would get repurposed to do something else. And then we would suddenly realize we have these pain points and have to come back to that. And so we kind of yo-yo trying to find the right size. Cause you know, when you're, you know, when you're a small private company, you're, you know, your, your goal is still revenue at the end of the day. Right? I mean, for every company it is, but you know, you feel that burden of, of orienting around revenue and your product much more than your developer practices. And so, um, you know, we've tried different models and we're big enough now where we can actually have engineering teams that have a lot of space to just work on the developer experience and the developer platform overall. Uh, but even then there's there's still tension on are they working on developer experience versus, you know, from a CI CD perspective or on kind of shared libraries that, you know, like design systems. Um, you know, design systems are much closer to the product than how fast your code deploys, right? Where there's 20 minutes or 30 minutes, like, you know, do your product managers care about the difference between 20 minutes and 30 minutes? Um, or do they care about, you know, just, you know, generally your engineers working faster. So I think, you know, it also comes down, we've kind of talked about the human problem at the beginning. Um, it's really important as much as you can create a culture of empathy and understanding among your teams of how the developer experience um, and the, the, the ability to deploy code, you know, with a lot of correctness, robustness, you know, and quickly, how that impacts your ability to go to market, right? Because I think every product manager, every chief revenue officer or CEO wants you to ship, ship ship software as fast as you can, right? That's kind of our goal, right? Ship software as fast as you can, but that software needs to work. Um, and how do you, you know, how do you internally allow others to have a window into what that means um, as, as engineers, um, you know, what those platforms, the health of those platforms, why does that really matter? I think a lot of times engineers, we don't do that very well. We just say, well, trust us as engineers, this needs to, you know, we need to get from 30 minutes to 20 minutes. But how do we translate that to impact on the broader org? That's hard. It's really, really hard. 
um, and something I don't, you know, I'm constantly trying to get better at. Yeah, and, it, and that opens up, a, I think, a pretty good topic around like process. And, and I'm sure that you've seen, it sounds like seven years at Strava from smaller to larger, probably, you know, increased expectations. Um, I, you know, I'm curious if we could circle back around this in a little bit and talk a little bit about how, you know, the process around that has kind of changed, um, you know, when we look at, you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, before we do that, uh, Turin, I'm, I'm curious, what, what do you think, a, you know, a, a well-balanced team looks like in terms of being able to, you know, eliminate bottlenecks and, you know, being able to, you know, facilitate an automated, much of an automated process as possible. So we recently switched to a Spotify squad model. Um, prior to that, we were uh, a project-based uh, delivery, right? And what we noticed is that, um, you know, teams would have competing priorities. The, the backend team is working on something, native is working on something else, web is working on something else, and they have their own priorities that they want to solve, right? So there wasn't as good of an alignment. Uh, so we, when we changed to a squad model, what that meant was the, the squads had the autonomy um, and the staff to support uh, the initiatives that they want to uh, work on. Um, so we look at opportunity boards, we look at uh, customer reviews, we look at um, user feedback, app reviews, all of these things combined together within each individual squad and they can you know, fuel up whatever they want to work on and you know tie it back to the OKRs that I was referring to. Uh, so that process shift really helped us um, and it motivates the engineers and, and entire squad saying that you know here's a problem that I am choosing to solve as a squad and you know I have all the tools and the staff to to go solve for it. Um, there is autonomy and at the same time there is you know uh, communication and collaboration that is happening across the squads. Uh, as we get into planning, then we say squad A is going to work on this, which means that eventually it's going to fuel some other uh, initiative coming in for another squad, or it's going to lay the foundation for other squads to follow. So that has helped tremendously from a process standpoint. Um, I want to touch on something that Lauren talked about, uh, if that's okay, uh, about CICD and having, uh, you know, kind of making sure it's not a long drawn process. Um, so, you know, traditionally there is always this push and pull between dev and test saying that, okay, we have delivered the code, but we are not ready to let go of the testing because we have a bunch of other tests that we want to do with other dependencies, with other scenarios and all those things. So um, where does that, you know, that leads to a kind of bloated uh, CICD pipeline and not being able to deliver or, or, or um, the code into prod as soon as as quickly as we can. So another shift that we did is dark launches. So um, we are able to um, tag all our features uh, to to be able to launch darkly into into prod um, and have a parallel suite uh, or a parallel pipeline that does a testing. And when we are ready then we can flip the flag so that it's available for our users yeah yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense and, it, and actually as you were talking too uh you know as you're talking about kind of a squad based and you know the ability to test i'm curious and this is this is probably a little bit of curveball because i don't know if we've actually you know even through the prep or kind of talking about it today but i like throwing these curveballs out there but we're in, i'm i'm curious and i'm going to get everybody's take on this but what about tech debt right tech debt as a bottleneck because you know as we talk about some of this and we talk about how teams are set up and we talk about an automated process one of the things that i think that everybody out there um, and ourselves included could can kind of relate to is that tech debt is kind of inevitable so you know how you know as the topics that we've hit on between automation and how we set up teams i'm curious like lauren how do you see you know, tech debt as as a bottleneck. I mean, do you see it as a bottleneck, and how do you typically address that? Um, yeah. Or you know, how are you addressing it, or how would you ideally like to address it? I guess maybe if those are two different things. So, uh, I think it's interesting. I, I would say the first thing that I I, I saw was that um, I think maybe 
five years ago or even 10 years ago, there was a huge emphasis on making microservices. And I think that's what, in my opinion, caused the most tech debt. Uh, is because uh, microservices considered, I think, too far the fact that things should be run in isolation. And that actually meant for a lot of teams they could run in complete isolation of coding standards. And so what would you end up doing is that you have a microservice and then it's totally up to the developers to say, you know what, my favorite programming language is that. Uh, and then I'm going to do also, I love this framework. And I saw how they were doing it in that other service and I don't like it. So let me show you how I would do it if I had to do it from the blank page. And so I think that in my opinion, at least from my world, because I don't know too much about how things work on the you know, front end side, but from, from what I've seen is that that was the biggest problem in my opinion. And so uh, the first thing I did when uh, I started, you know, thinking about the architecture for Waldo was to say, I definitely want microservices in terms of isolation of runtime. I want to make sure that no one can access everybody else. And I want to make sure that this is, you know, very easy to triage. We were talking about observability. It's very good to know that if you have a memory leak, it's caused by this portion of, you know, your business logic and not by anything that happens somewhere. However, I forced from the very beginning that it's a monorepo, meaning that you have to share exactly the same coding standards and the deployment strategy and all of that. And the biggest tech that I've seen usually was like, you know, um you now you want to go from one version of the um, i don't know code based tools framework but now like you, you you basically have to decide whether you want to apply it back to that old service that anyway you don't even know if it's being used or not uh so yeah i, I guess that's uh that's how i saw that there's many other places of tech that uh, i think sometimes it's a little too tempting to go after it and sometimes it's actually fine to have some dead code somewhere and it's it's okay uh, but i think like fundamentally and structurally at least what i saw the, to be the biggest pain point was to allow any coding standards to jump in and and go into your organization and engineering all yeah and that brings up a good point too because i think we've talked a little bit you know throughout the conversation today talking a little bit about autonomy and ownership um, and being able to do those things, or even Jason had mentioned before, you know, being able to take that extra step and, you know, be creative or, you know, you know, trying to solve a, a particular problem. And I think that there's that balance there, right? As you mentioned, Lauren, where, yeah, you can do that, but it's also, you know, it's kind of a, you know, a, a catch-22 sometimes where, you know, yeah, you can solve some problems like that, but you can also go so off you know, off path, uh, off the beaten path of what we're using, like maybe you're using Go or something like that when everybody else is using, you know, Java or something um, that it can end up, you know, causing more harm um, than good. But I'm interested, Jason, what, what do you think about tech debt? You know, after Lauren kind of mentioned on that, I, I saw, I know you, you reacted. So I, uh, I assume, I'm assuming you got some opinions about it. So I'm curious what you think about it. Love this question. Uh, I, you know, it's, this is the only question I was hoping you would ask me this whole time. Um, I I don't like the term tech debt because if you think about the metaphor to the real world, like debt is something you incur knowing you're you know mortgaging the future for the present, right? And for the most part, engineers aren't doing that, right? Yes, there are cases where we're cutting corners, we have to for something, but for the most part, the things we refer to as tech debt aren't that. It's just hey, there was a different technology. We all used Ruby on Rails eight years ago because that was the thing. Like it wasn't a bad decision back then. And I think we kind of refer to tech debt as those engineers made those bad decisions. It's like, no, that's not it. And, I, and that's why I just hate the word debt because debt just in, implies people didn't do their jobs when they could have, right? Um, and yes, there are times where we cut corners and that's perfectly okay. You know, um, that's part of being an engineer is knowing when the right corners to be cut, but then you create, you know, a plan to, to solve that. So anyway, I don't love the word tech debt. I think, you know, um, modernizing your technology stack is is something that you're always going to have to do right like you can't drive the same car for forever right it's going to fall apart um and you know that's a very poor metaphor for for tech but you know you constantly need to be need to be um adapting and i think if you look at you know the law of thermodynamics i think it's the third or second law where entropy is only increasing in your system right the world things are just decaying right that's just a law of nature and you have to be doing work into it 
And if, and it's not just engineering, like I work so much with the business metrics that like, if we don't touch our business metrics, they go down. We have to constantly be fighting to keep them level. And then it's even harder to get, to get them to increase. Things don't just stay the way they are, nor will your technology should they stay the way that it is, right? So I think that's where the alignment needs to be internally of, we need to constantly be, be paying down towards the future. Just like when you own a car, that car is depreciating over time, right? You should be every month saving you know, a hundred dollars towards, you know, buying another car in 36 months if you're doing the accounting, right? Accountants understand depreciation so much better than anyone else because it's part of the job. And that's all we're doing. We're handling tech depreciation that we need to adapt. And for many organizations, you wait until it's too late, right? Until all of your databases are, are you know, have, have too many requests coming in, you can't handle it, or your API layer is not handling, you know, the, the throughput, et cetera. So, um, I think that's just the kind of perspective of realizing that you just have to be paying this down. Product does it, tech does it, accounting does it. How are you going to approach it? And how are you going to create a really clear plan? Because I think what's frustrating for cross-functional partners is hearing, hey, we need to take a pause to work on this thing because we have to, it's an engineering thing. But if you're constantly in dialogue with here's our plan, here's where we're at, here's the one-year plan, the three-year plan, the five-year plan, and then you're updating that as you go and you're communicating it, then it's not this abstract thing that you're asking others to just trust you on. It's a clear plan. Even if they don't know the details, they can still be like, cool, Rob, Rob's done his due diligence with his team. They have a plan. You know, you know, people like to trust people with the plan versus the trust me. So that's that's more of my meta kind of argument. I love, I love it though. I love the the tech debt question. No, I, I love it because I, I think what you know, if I were to kind of you know, maybe a, a very, you know, I guess, simple TLDR on this. It's like you're basically describing it as being a lot more proactive rather than reactive, because at that point it's too late. And and I think you you also hit it pretty well in the head, which is that it's almost like how you think of financial responsibility, right? Being fiscally responsible um, in order to be able to kind of plan ahead and you know prepare as necessary. It's almost like being developmentally responsible. Um, you know, and, and, you know, doing it in a proactive way. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I, I really like the idea of not calling it tech debt because that's what I'm going to tell the next person that brings it up to me. Be like, no, 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 no. I heard that was not a thing. Uh, tech debt is not a thing. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, Tarun, I'm, I'm curious, like, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, just on, you know, tech debt as as a bottleneck and, you know, how, how do you approach that? So Jason is not going to like what, like what I'm about to say right now. So I increased the scope of what tech debt is. Um, I said, if you're not automating, that's tech debt. If you're punting it for next sprint or whatever it is, right, I'm going to consider that as a tech debt, right? I mean, I know it's got a tech debt as, as a negative connotation. So kind of using that to, to motivate uh, the entire engineering team to approach it as a tech debt. Right, so we accept, and then, which means we have to solve for it uh, eventually. Um, but I feel like a lot of the tech debt is introduced when we're doing uh, spikes and POCs, and we seem to, you know, want to make the POC work. Uh, you know, POC should be a throwaway work, and you know, once we have learned enough from it, then start with your architecture from your foundational stuff from what the learnings from the POC, rather than saying, yep, we tried this technology or we, we tried this framework, it works. Now, how can we add this to the next sprint and then keep building on top of it? Um, that introduces a lot of tech debt. And um, as leaders, you know, driving the culture where, you know, POCs doesn't mean that we are gonna, you know, continue to append to that um, definitely helps uh, curb the tech debt. Yeah, I mean, I've never, I've never pushed a POC to production. I don't know about it, anybody else, but <laughs> I've never pushed P. No, I'm just kidding. I've done that plenty of times. In fact, you could probably just call all my code POC code. Uh, that might be, that might be a good idea. Uh, I'm going to pull one of the questions, kind of switch it up a little bit here, but I'm going to pull one of the questions from, from the audience. And let's see. So, what's the role of low-level test, like unit test, integration tests, in order to be able to solve bottlenecks? And we've kind of touched around this a little bit, um, but I'm curious, Loren, what do you think? you know, the role of, you know, those lower level tests are in order to be able to, you know, solve some of these bottlenecks that we've come. Uh, yeah. So I think it goes back to all the, the, the question about ownership and uh, oh, that's also something that Taran has talked about. Uh, so you were mentioning that you want the code and the, 
and the feature to be part of the, the same uh, mono repo. Um, I think that's where having the right uh, test as the right layers make the ownership very simple uh, because you know exactly what you need to change. So if you have a component that you're working on and it changes the UI and then you have your unit tests that are checking like uh, very clearly um, some uh, snapshot testing on some components, how they should render, it, it's super simple for you to see that this is what you have to change in the testing that corresponds to the change that you're making in your component. And it's same goes for the integration testing. And then for the end-to-end -end testing is where it becomes very, it, it becomes a little trickier to share the, to share and not share the ownership uh, because that's usually something that's um, running somewhere. And especially if you run them only on a later stage, you never really know who has broken which test, uh, which is trickier. So this is where I think the, the lower level tests uh, are the, easier to maintain and to um, keep track of. So I think personally, I'm a huge fan of integration testing for everything backend because it's it's request response. So it's super easy to, to just be at that layer and say, okay, request response. If ever I break one, I know what to do. Yeah, makes sense. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Uh, I think that was a pretty it was a pretty good answer, but Turin, I could see you uh, could see you grinning over there, like you want to weigh in a little bit. Well, I think what I've noticed is that unit tests are a matter of pride, right? Um, it's you could set up water processes, you could set up you know PRs and all of those things, but it, it comes down to you know uh, pride of the engineer wanting to have good tests to cover their code uh, and you have more of that you'll you build enough critical mass where it becomes a cultural thing in the organization so that's that's my observation about unit tests yeah makes sense and you might like this jason is that one of the some feedback we got is that uh, tech debt is not only inevitable but it's needed um, it's like saying you know getting a mortgage is bad essentially it's it's i think what they're trying to say here is it's progress right being able to you know identify something as tech debt or however we want to, you know, describe it, um, essentially is basically us improving, uh, you know, whether it's pulling in a better framework or a better language with, you know, I say better language, but, you know, language with different features, essentially, that we can take advantage of. Um, figured you'd probably like that a little bit. Well, it, it seems like we're coming a little bit close to the top of the hour here. So I wanted to kind of give everybody a little bit of time um, to give me a couple some an elevator pitch i guess if you will a little tldr if if you were going to you know based on the discussion today and you're going to wrap it up in an elevator pitch um you know how to address bottlenecks specifically it doesn't have to necessarily be mobile development just, but just development in general what would your pitch be you know or advice to somebody let's say that there's a junior developer out there that you know is just getting started they don't have the you know we'll say the maybe some of the jaded nature or you know some of the ptsd that some of us do um, whenever it comes to this but how would you have them look at um, bottlenecks you know as they're entering their career or, you know gaining more experience what's your pitch on you know both coming up with a resolution of those things and that's pretty abstract but i'm hoping that you guys can kind of take this in in whatever direction uh you know suits you we'll start with you taryn um if i want to go back to when i started in you know uh as a junior developer i think i think i always wanted to write code you know it was very biased action bias to just write code um, and not fully understand why I'm doing it, what problem I'm solving, right? So opening that communication channel and understanding from top to bottom why we're doing this and what what puzzle am I trying to solve, right? What is what is this piece going to? How is this piece going to fit in the bigger uh, picture? So that that for me, uh, you know, you start going through the exploration process of that opens up so many doors and opens up um, a different perspective to how we approach software development. Um, someone mentioned, I think it might be you, Rob, is that it's a human problem, right? And we should not 
uh, we should never lose sight of that. And if you start approaching it through through, through that lens, um, that'll certainly change the direction or change the perspective of how we approach uh, software development. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Jason, what do you, what, what's your pitch? Uh, I mean, so much good stuff in here. I think you know, solve problems collaboratively. Um, you know, solving on your own um, is is never the, the full the right answer. Like, you need to bring other people's perspectives. You know, what you think is difficult might not be what the, the rest of your team thinks is difficult. Um, it's really important to seek other opinions out, especially outside of engineering as well. And then really think about the ROI of of your kind of of the problems you're trying to solve. Um, it's really easy. We're all guilty of it, right? Of solving something that you you, know, you feel very passionate about that like at the end of the day doesn't really matter. And then you get frustrated because you're like, why does no one else care? Or you know, you do it and then three months later, you know, that change is is ripped out or whatever. You know, thinking about the ROI from a time perspective, from a cost saving perspective, but like you know, being brutal with that because um, no matter how big of a company you're at, there's gonna be problems out there that could be solved. But just because they are, are there doesn't mean they should be solved. Um, and sometimes, you know, the you know the best engineers are the ones who can see different problems, identify, you know, these are the ones we're okay with with having and, and incurring. We're gonna document them, we're gonna understand them, but we're gonna keep them on the shelf. And this is the one I'm gonna solve. Um, and so I think that's just you know that lens and being able to communicate with that lens helps helps bring other people along. Yeah, you're killing it with this responsible development, Jason. I, I'm loving it uh, so far. Uh, Lauren, what, what, what's your pitch? Um, I, I'd actually uh, say that the interesting part I think about bottlenecks is it's always coming from uh, different uh, people uh, having to interfere. So I don't think if you're a solo entrepreneur or a solo um, Coder on a product, you're not you're not really going to have any bottlenecks. So bottlenecks really come from that need of communication between teams or individuals or actually like parts of the business. And so from what I would say is that like what you need probably uh, and it's, it's more like an opinion out there is so transparency is probably one of the best way to put all these things happening out there so that you don't get surprised because that's going to be probably the worst one is there's a lot of things done and then you have to go back the worst one being we built something that was not necessary go back to the starting line um, and the second one is probably and this is where it's more an opinion but designing a process so that you can have large building blocks where you don't have any external dependencies because these are your bottlenecks. So trying to kind of isolate in my um, cycle, these are where these are the points where we need consensus. We need to make sure of what we're doing. And this is where I can go with the flow. And ideally for a long time, because then now I'm not impacted with any bottlenecks. Perfect. Perfect advice. Yeah, I love it. Uh, and that, that hits us like right at uh, the top of the hour. So I'd like to say thank you very much, of course, to the panelists, you know, answering you know, these questions. It's been awesome, you know, being able to absorb your guys' knowledge um, on this stuff. I'd like to thank everybody who attended and, of course, Waldo for, for putting this on. Um, to make these webinars better, uh, there is a short survey after. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out, you know, basically just rating how we did, um, you know, what we could do better, um, and also what you'd like to hear from a topic going forward um, would be super helpful for us. But uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Um, this has been a really awesome experience. Till Thanks next time. Thanks, Rob, for hosting. Of course. This was great. <laughs> this was fun. Bye, everyone.